and welcome to our online service for this the fourth Sunday of Easter but more importantly for us here in this parish is the day in which we've been celebrating the Feast of St Mark. Last Tuesday April the 25th was the day in our lectionary where we annually remember the saint and so today the following Sunday we've been celebrating his feast day and particularly of course doing it in our own church of St Mark in Pease Lake. To make it, make it extra special uh, our bishop, Bishop Andrew, came and joined us and he preached and we recorded that sermon so you'll be hearing it in a few minutes time uh, and also presided at our Eucharist. Our intercessions this morning were led by Sarah, Sarah Hutton, uh, and we'll, you'll be hearing those too. Uh, but Sarah was also there to receive her new licence from the bishop. She's been our curate for a number of years but from today she's now our associate minister uh, and Bishop Andrew presented her with that licence. Um, so it's been a it's been a great day uh, and a wonderful celebration this morning and it's good that you're going to be sharing in some key moments of that online. Uh, it's also my last uh, day before I begin my study leave, my three month sabbatical. Uh, this is the last service uh, for me until the end of July when I shall be back for my first service on my return for the Feast of St James. So uh, very appropriate as far as I'm concerned. So um, our first reading this morning was from the book of Acts uh, and I'm going to read that reading to you now. The reading is from Acts chapter 15 beginning at the 35th verse. Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch and there with many others they taught and proclaimed the word of the Lord. After some days Paul said to Barnabas, come let us return and visit the believers in every city where we, where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in their work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it is a real joy to be visiting St Mark's for the first time today. And on St Mark's Day, well, a few days after St Mark's Day, but we're celebrating it. I hope you've admired the window, the third from the, uh, from, from the end here, which is a lovely picture of St Mark in stained glass. Do have a look at that afterwards complete with this lion, which we'll be thinking about a bit later on in our service. And it's lovely too to be licensing Sarah Hutton, which I'll shortly be doing, already obviously very well known to you as your, officially as your Associate Minister. Shall we pay? Heavenly Father, thank you very much for this lovely morning, and thank you for St Mark, whom we celebrate today. We pray your blessing as we look at your word together that you would encourage and strengthen and challenge us this day. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Do please sit down. <coughs> it was a warm evening in June 2017, and there I was in the banqueting suite of Guildford's Mandalay Hotel, sitting next to the Pope. Not that Pope, but the other one, Pope Tewadros II, Patriarch of the See of Alexandria and head of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Just three months before, on Palm Sunday 2017, Pope Tewadros had been presiding at a communion service in Alexandria Cathedral when a bomb went off inside the church, killing 13 people and injuring at least 20 others. ISIS, the radical Islamic group, was clearly targeting him and his family, along with the Coptic church across Egypt more generally. And as I heard his stories of extraordinary courage in what is one of the most ancient and one of the most persecuted of all churches around the world, so I was struck by the way its founder is regularly portrayed in Christian iconography. For while the evangelist Matthew, you may remember, is regularly pictured as a man, and Luke as an ox, and John as an eagle, the evangelist Mark, by tradition, 
the first Bishop of Alexandria and founder of the Coptic Church, is pictured as a lion. Indeed, it's Mark's courage, most especially in his martyrdom, as a rope was placed around his neck before being dragged through the streets of Alexandria, which has inspired countless generations of Coptic worshippers for whom the possibility of martyrdom is almost baked into their understanding of what it means to follow Christ. That was baked into Jesus' understanding as well. And Mark's Gospel regularly highlights the sheer cost of discipleship, not least in our Gospel reading this morning, which could have been written for a Coptic audience if we were to substitute synagogues for Sharia courts. As for yourselves, beware, for they will hand you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them. That's a theme in the other Gospels as well, of course, but comes across especially strongly in Mark, who would himself be tested in similar ways before gaining the martyr's crown. There's something hurried about Mark's Gospel too, compared with the others. This lion isn't messing about. So there's no point in hunting through his Gospel for good Christmas readings, as we do through Matthew and Luke because Mark is not really very bothered about the infant Jesus. And there's no point in looking for long, deep theological reflections, as we do in the Gospel of John, because Mark's not too bothered with those either. He even rushes through Easter and the resurrection appearances, though most scholars believe that that's partly because the original ending of his Gospel was lost. Instead, Mark's favourite word, right from the word go, is euthus, which means immediately. Following Jesus' baptism, the Spirit immediately drives him into the desert. A little later on, Simon and Andrew immediately leave their nets and their father and follow him, before Jesus immediately calls James and John as well. Immediately, his fame begins to spread through Galilee, not least when a leper is immediately healed of his leprosy and begins to spread the word having been immediately commanded not to do so. And that's just in chapter 1. You can see that Mark really enjoys the word immediately. In around 100 AD, a man called Papias wrote about Mark's Gospel following conversations which he'd had with a first-generation Christian. And here's what he wrote. Mark, in his capacity as Peter's interpreter, wrote down accurately as many things as he recalled from memory though not in an ordered form of the things either said or done by the Lord. And if that's right, that Mark was Peter's interpreter, the impatience and breakneck speed of his gospel certainly tallies with Peter's tendency to jump in with two feet. Mark is the gospel for those with a limited attention span. So what else do we know about Mark? Or to give him his full name, John Mark, the lion. We know that his mother was called Mary, yet another Mary in the New Testament. We know that Mary owned a large house in Jerusalem, the one in which a big bunch of Christians gathered to pray on one of the occasions when Peter was locked up in prison. We presume that Mary and her husband were Jewish, but not strongly nationalistic, or they wouldn't have given their son two names, one uh, Hebrew and the other Roman. John, which means God is gracious in Hebrew, and Mark, which derives from Mars, the Roman god of war. We know that he was cousin of another of the best supporting actors in the book of Acts, Barnabas, whose name means the son of encouragement. And we know that he accompanied both Paul and Barnabas on some of their missionary travels in modern-day Turkey and Greece. Mark's name pops up in the letter to the Colossians, where Paul writes, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. He also pop pops up in Philemon, where Paul describes him as one of his fellow workers, and in 2 Timothy, where he's described as helpful to me in my ministry. And it's not just Paul who appreciates Mark, but Peter as well. Indeed, in his first letter, Peter speaks affectionately of Mark as, quote, my son. 
And if that's all we knew about Mark, this great martyr for the faith, this courageous companion of Peter and Paul, this lion among the evangelists, then his story would be both more consistent and far less interesting. But there are two further stories in Mark's Gospel and the Book of Acts that suggest a rather different picture. That Mark's courage didn't come naturally to him. Indeed, that without his cousin Barnabas' encouragement, Mark would never have got off the starting blocks at all. The first story is a bit tendentious. It occurs only in Mark's Gospel at that crucial moment when Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it reads like this. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a loincloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off naked. It's impossible to know for sure, but Mark lives in Jerusalem, and could that maybe have been his own personal recollection? You'd hardly forget running off naked into the night. But the second story represents a much more proven case of running off. It begins in Acts chapter 9, where John Mark accompanies Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey, and where Paul writes that John, however, left them and returned to Jerusalem. And it continues with this morning's reading from Acts chapter 15, where Paul and Barnabas were setting off on their missionary travels once again, and Paul was adamant that John Mark shouldn't come with them because of his earlier flakiness. Because, as we read, he had deserted them in Pamphylia and not accompanied them in their work. Had Mark maybe had a severe bout of homesickness on that first occasion? Couldn't he keep up with Paul's pace? Or was he frightened by the opposition that they encountered every step of the journey? We don't know the full story. But what we do know is that his desertion resulted in a stand-up row between Paul and Barnabas. The Greek word used is paroxysmos, from which we derive our English word paroxysm. So we're not talking just about a mild difference of opinion here. We're talking of something verging on fisticuffs. And the result was that Paul chose a new companion, Silas, and set off in one direction on missionary journey number two, while Barnabas took his bruised cousin under his wing on a little missionary journey of their own to Barnabas' home country on the island of Cyprus. So here was the lion in earlier life, a rather bewildered, frightened lion cub, whose desertion from the cause had so enraged the mighty Paul. And just as Barnabas in earlier days had helped to rehabilitate Paul himself, so had he was now being called to rehabilitate John Mark. A perfect job for this well-named son of encouragement. Instinctively, perhaps, we take Barnabas' side in the stand-up battle. Though those missionary journeys were really tough, and perhaps we can empathise with Paul a little too. The Apostle needed someone able to withstand the inevitable imprisonments and stonings that would accompany their travels, rather than running off to Mum at the first opportunity. But when we see what happened to the lion cub as a result of Barnabas' encouragement, how he grew up into the lion of the Gospel writers, the founder of the Coptic Church and a martyr for the cause. So we're reminded that God is the God of the second chance and the third chance and the tenth chance and the 70 times 70th chance. That Jesus, the ultimate son of encouragement, continues to believe in us even when we mess things up. Not so that we become lazy and complacent in our Christian discipleship, but quite the reverse, so that we become the faithful, courageous soldiers of Christ whom he has called us to be. That's why it's so moving that Peter calls Mark my son and chose him, if Papias is right, to act as his interpreter in the pages of Mark's Gospel. It's why it's still more moving that Paul, I'm sure repentant of having lost his rag some years before, referred to Mark as his fellow worker who was helpful to me in my ministry. For there's something extraordinarily powerful about believing in people through thick and thin. Peter the Rock had himself experienced that. So had Paul, 
and now Mark the Lion would experience that too. And as we celebrate Mark's feast day and the Coptic Orthodox Church he founded, and the church in Pisa named in his honour with a stained glass window complete with lion to boot, we give thanks for the God of second chances. Perhaps Sarah's licensing fits that theme too, because Sarah in her day job is nurturing lion cubs who are variously nervous, studious, well-behaved and unruly. And Sarah's ministry in the parish too flows from her belief in a God who delights to place the glorious treasure of his gospel into the most fragile of clay pots. So that as a later, more reflective Paul would write, it becomes clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Mark the Lion would demonstrate that extraordinary power in his life and in his dying. A power that was released through his cousin's encouragement. Others in more recent times would share the same testimony, including one of my own children, whose path through school days was horribly stormy and who left with just a clutch of C's of GCSE, but whose graduation as a doctor of philosophy at Oxford University we will be attending in a fortnight's time. And as we, within our friendship and family groups, and our work within the churches and villages of Shear and Peace Lake, wherever you live, come across others who are struggling with life, maybe a child or a grandchild, a work colleague, a neighbour, let's resolve never to give up on them, but always to keep believing, keep praying on their behalf, reminding ourselves that with God, nothing is impossible that even the most nervy and disappointing of lion cubs can be transformed into the most courageous and inspiring of lions. Shall we pray? And perhaps in quietness we might bring before God any, especially on our hearts, any who maybe we are supporting at this time. Through their own sense of inadequacy or failure, battles with mental illness, depression. we give thanks, Heavenly Father, for the rehabilitation of Mark through the encouragement of Barnabas. So we pray that each one of us here might both receive your encouragement in our own battles and struggles, but also be encouragers of others. that we, that they might grow into the full stature of what it means to be created in your image and a child of the King of Kings. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the feast of St. Mark, who established the Coptic Church and was probably martyred for his faith, we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. Those who are gathered as we are to worship you in freedom and with joy those who are gathered in secret to worship this day, doing so faithfully, but under the fear of persecution. And those who are worshipping you alone, separated from their fellow Christians through political or personal circumstance. Help us to worship you wherever we find ourselves, 
Give each one of us, whatever our context, the courage to share the good news with those we meet each day. Lord, in your mercy. Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, we bring before you the areas of the world where conflict abounds, where war and violence dominate daily life. Continue to pray for Ukraine and Yemen. We lift before you the people of Sudan and cry out for peace and a cessation to violence and the desire for power at the cost of innocent lives. May safety and security be restored and those fleeing for their lives find refuge. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing and comforting spirit, you love us and know our frailty. We pray for all who are suffering in mind, body or spirit at this time. For those who struggle with loneliness or despair. And those who are caring for them. In a few moments of silence, let us name before God those known to us. Surround those we have named with your healing love. Lord, in your mercy. God of life and love, we remember those we have loved and seen no longer. For those who have died and for all those who mourn this day. We remember and give thanks for the life of Jean Bellicott, praying for her family and friends. Surround all those who mourn with your continuing compassion and bring healing to broken hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Servant Lord, as we prepare for the coronation of King Charles, we pray for all those involved. We pray that as millions of people watch a Christian service of commitment to servant leadership of, to a people and commonwealth, that hearts will be moved to seek deeper meaning for their lives and to find you. We pray for Archbishop Justin, for all who will be playing a part in the coronation and for all who will work to support it and our celebrations with their care and service, that they may be given the strength to carry out the duties entrusted to them. And we pray for all those in positions of leadership in their lives and work, for our politicians, for our bishops and clergy, for those leading businesses, schools and companies. As they carry the heavy burden of responsibility, may they turn to you for wisdom, discernment and right judgment, seeking to work towards the good of all particularly the most vulnerable in our world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And the for the King and the Royal Family. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, bless our Sovereign Lord, King Charles, and all who are in authority under him, that they may that they may order all things in wisdom and equity, righteousness and peace, to the honour of your name and the good of your church and people. Bless, we pray, Camilla the Queen Consort, William, Prince of Wales, the Princess of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with your Holy Spirit, enrich them with your heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to your everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And finally, a prayer for ourselves. Living God, you bring us together in community and teach us to love one another as you have loved us. May we be beacons of your light in the communities in which we are set, that through truth, justice, and action, we may see your kingdom come upon earth 
in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Merciful Father, Jesus Christ. 